Let's get you back into the courtroom where a paramedic is on the stand right now. Let's get you back to court. The end time will be 24 hours later, uh, 5 a.m. to 5 a.m. or 7 a.m. to 7. Okay. And do you recall if you were working on April 22nd of 2016? Uh, yes, I was. Okay. And uh, can you tell us um, if you were um, ultimately dispatched to a location on Union Hill Road? Yes. Do you have any idea of approximately what time that was? Um, a little after 7 in the morning. Okay. Um, do you have, um, let me ask you this, when you um, do a run, when you're dispatched to a location, mm -hmm. um, do you complete what's called a run report? Yes. Ultimately. Okay. And um, did you do that in this situation? Yes. Okay. And is that something you do um, as shortly thereafter as possible? Yes. To doing the run? And you do that every time? Yes. Is that correct? Um, and it's something that you fill out by hand? Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Um, if I were to provide you um, your run report from this day, would that refresh your recollection as to the exact time yes. that you were dispatched? Okay. <clears throat> Handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit R1. If you could just first of all look at that and tell me if you recognize that. Yes. And what do you recognize that as? Uh, this was one of my run sheets. Okay. One of your run sheets? Yes. Okay. From April 22nd of 2016? Yes. Okay. And you said one of your run sheets. Was there, is there an additional run sheet for that day? Yes. Okay. We'll get to that later. <laughs> um, and does it say on there um, what time you were yes, it dispatched? Does. And what time was that? 8.13. Uh, okay. And um, uh, does it also indicate approximately what time you arrived? Uh, 8.42. Okay. And can you tell us um, what the call, when you were dispatched, what did you believe the call to be? Or what did you believe you were responding to? Uh, we believe we were responding to a possible domestic violence. Um, they said there may or may not be uh, someone dead on scene um, and that there may have been an assault. Okay. And was it just, um, first of all, did you have a partner that day? Yes, I did. Okay. And is that typical for ambulances to have yes. more than one person? There's always two. Okay. And it, it, can you tell us who your partner was that day? Um, it was Jeff. Okay. And Jeff? He is my husband. Okay. So same last name? Yes. Okay. And um, do you recall who was driving that day? Uh, Jeff was driving. Okay. And is there a reason for that? Uh, he is a basic EMT and I am a paramedic. So normally if we were on any runs, he would drive and I would do patient care um, just because of the uh, higher level. Okay. And that would be, even if, it, um, is that kind of the standard for any ambulance or if you can try yes, to Yes, especially on emergencies or things like that, just to have the highest level provider in the back with the patient. Okay. And how many um, units from your um, ambulance service was were dispatched at that time? Um, when we were dispatched, there was two units. Okay. And then later a third okay. was sent. Do you typically have that many ambulances on staff at any given time? Um, at the time, yes. We, we would normally run three 24-hour shifts. Okay. And do you recall, um, you said there were two initially. Um, were you one of the first 
ones that were dispatched. Yes, uh, my husband and I were the first truck, and then Justin and his partner were the were directly behind us. Okay. And do you remember who was Justin's partner at that time? Uh, Chuck Turner. Okay. And you said Justin. Do you know his last name? Wary. And you said you were the first truck and they were the second truck. How close uh, were you guys as far as when you traveled? Uh, we could see them behind us. Okay. And can you tell us, um, do you recall the location that you were dispatched to? Um, it was Union Hill Road. Okay. And did you arrive at that location? Yes. And what did you see or say or do once you got there? Uh, when we pulled up to the to the first residence, um, we pulled up and Justin pulled up right behind us. We both got out. Um, at that point, they had said that there was more locations down the road. Um, so Justin stayed there and we got back in the truck and continued down to the next residence. At that time, we were told by an officer um, that we weren't needed there, um, that there was deceased, but that they believed there was someone on down the road that was alive and needed help. Um, so we continued down to a third residence. Uh, when we got there, Pike County had a truck on scene and uh, Daryl Hart, which is a paramedic with them, was coming out with a baby. Uh, I asked him if he needed anything, if he needed any help. He said no, everything was fine, and that he was going to be going to Adams County Hospital. So then we returned to that second residence and waited until we were told Okay. what See, else to do. Okay. You gave us a lot. Dave. She, along with everybody else in that really small rural community, still shaken up. This happened in 2016 and reliving it right now on the stand. After the break, we continue our coverage of the Ohio Family Massacre trial, where the Wagner family is accused of killing eight members of the Roden family over a custody dispute. We'll be right back. Tonight, on closing arguments, George Wagner IV faces a jury for his alleged role in an Ohio family massacre. What legal strategies are we seeing as the prosecution presents their case? We'll show you the biggest highlights from today's live trial coverage. And on the docket, we get you ready for tomorrow's hearing in the case against the doomsday couple, Chad and Lori Daybell. This is everything you need to know before these proceedings get underway. Closing arguments tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. They can save 15%. Welcome back. We are in day two of testimony in the Ohio Family Massacre trial. George Wagner IV is on trial for his alleged involvement in the murder of eight members of the Roden family over a custody battle in 2016. The defendant's brother and mother have already pled guilty to their involvement, and Wagner's father is expected to go on trial at a later date. Currently, a paramedic is on the stand right now testifying. You haven't missed a thing. Let's get you back to court. But do you recall the path that you took that day to get to Union Hill Road? Yes, we went 32 to 772 and then turned on to Union Hill Road. Okay. And so that first location you came to, was, um, it, which is where Justin Waring ended up staying. Is yes. Is that correct? And you indicated, did you both get out of your vehicles at that time? Yes. Okay. And then he ended up staying there. Yes and you went on to a second location. And do you recall where the second location was? Just it in was the very next trailer. Okay. And do you remember if it was on the right hand or left hand side I of the road? I believe it was the right hand side of the road. Okay. And you indicated an officer said you were not needed, that there were individuals deceased, but your assistance was not needed there. Yeah. But that there was possibly some people alive down the road yes. that needed help. Okay. And um, when you got there, I believe you said that Daryl Hart was coming out of the residence with a baby? Yes. Okay. And he indicated that he was going to go to Adams County Hospital? Yes. With the baby? Mm -hmm. Was that your understanding? Okay. 
and you indicated then you went back to the second residence. So is that that second residence where the officer told you you weren't yeah. needed because there were deceased individuals? Yes. Okay. You indicated that you and the um, Justin Waring and the, the truck that had Justin Waring and Chuck Turner mm -hmm. in it um, were pretty much arrived at the same time. -ish. Yes. <laughs> um, if Justin Waring's report indicates that he arrived at 832 and your report says you arrived at 842, can you explain that 10 minute difference? <laughs> I didn't chart my time until I actually got back and stopped because we kind of went from one place to another to see where we were needed. And then when we finally stopped, I charted that time. Okay, so it would have been when you had already gone to the second location, the third location, and back to yes. the second location when you, okay. Yes. Perfect. And then was there a time where you changed your location from that second residence? Yes. Um, after a while, we were all told to go and stage. Okay. And do you recall who told you that or where that uh, order came from? That came from Sheriff Reader. Okay. And you were asked to stage. Do you recall where you staged? Uh, there was a dead end road. It was a little gravel road. Okay. Um, in the middle between the second and the third residence. Okay. And we staged at the end of that road. Okay. And let me show you the aerials first before we do that. So we have the paramedic that responded to the scene there, and she is showing the jury, um, you know, close to the jury box, you know, very demonstrative, you know, the map. These are the locations I went to. This was the horrible day in 2016, changed my life forever. You could see the, those wheels turning when she's talking. Um, we already heard from law enforcement that established the locations. Why is it important that we hear from this particular witness? Is it because of her emotion? Were they planning on that? Well, I think it's a combination of, I, mean, I think the, the prosecutor is doing is a really fine job with this witness and with a couple of previous ones, where what we're doing is you're actually adding a little bit more context to the situation. But what it's also doing is it's humanizing it. Mm -hmm. Because it's easy to come back and say almost, you're, you're a paramedic, you're a doctor, you're a police officer, you're almost technical in terms of how you approach them because you're trying to get specifics but what you also can do is you can you can delve into the fact that they're human beings they can provide that picture to this jury that nobody else can when the prosecutor asked about the baby and she said this the paramedic said and he took the baby to the hospital you heard her voice break and the thing is is it when it broke mine did the jury's did, yours did, and that has value because that shows the importance of these victims and that jury's going to remember that. That's really important as part of a strategy. And, you know, Josh, when we're talking about that, this is a community roughly, you know, I'm going to probably get it wrong, like 5,000 people or so. Everybody knows everybody. I think that the paramedic said that her husband was a paramedic too. Talk to me about that when 
you may know the person testifying. Yeah, it's the importance of that community connection. You're, you have a right to be tried by a jury of your peers from your local community. There's a regional thing. So, so this jury represents that community. And what I really feel that the goal, and it's been accomplished beautifully by the district attorney, was to show the care. Um, caring is the way you open people's hearts up to be, to listen and to hear what happened, adding to that context. It's adding the colors to a sketch on a painting. What do you expect, uh, Josh, to follow up on that? What do you expect the, the defense team to do here? Um, maybe no questions? It's hard, well, and that gets to an age old question. Do you just stand up and say no questions and sit down? Or do you need to ask something to show that you're participating on behalf of the defendant? And there's no real answer to that. At the same time, I think there are probably a couple technical issues that the defense will get up to acknowledge and recognize the trauma and the experience this EMT had because it's so notable. EMTs see all the awful in the world. And this is what moved them. That's a high bar. That's something the caring is contagious emanates from this woman. I need to get in a break, but did you have something short to add? Well, really simply, when we look at this as a, from a defense perspective, you're always asking, what questions do I ask a witness like this? What can I get out of them that helps me? Do I fight the fact that her, her logs had her off by 10 minutes? Who cares? That means nothing to anybody, and it actually would hurt me if I said something stupid. And so I'm far better off just saying, no questions, thank you so much for coming in today. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, coming up, more testimony from the paramedic who responded to that shocking crime scene. She continues to talk about what she saw in 2016. We'll be right back. Frigidaire. This was not a crime of passion. This was not in a fit of rage. These murders happened after a period of three months of planning and plotting and purchasing and preparing and executing eight individuals of a family. Hannah May Roden, her crime was not returning the love of Jake Wagner. These murders should have never happened. And welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Matt Johnson and for Judge Ashley this afternoon, you can watch her on closing arguments tonight. Back to the Ohio Family Massacre trial. George Wagner IV and three other family members are accused of murdering eight members of the Roden family six years ago. Prosecutors say the motive was a child custody dispute over a two-year-old little girl. Court TV cameras are in and out due to some witnesses requesting that their testimony not be shown on camera. We are respecting that. We wanted to be transparent with you. Currently, a paramedic is on the stand testifying about responding to those horrific crime scenes. Let's get you back to court. So you were staging between the second and third residences. Um, did you get um, asked to do anything else while you were there? Uh, yes, while we were staging, we were asked to go back to the first residence uh, to transport a child. Okay, and do you know that child's name? Yes, it was Ruger Roden. Okay. And do you know uh, how old Ruger Roden, Roden was at that time? Six months. Okay. And so you returned? Yes. Um, and what did you do when you got there? Uh, when we got there, Children's Services was there okay. um, with the child. Um, we spoke with them briefly, um, checked him, got his vitals, put him in um, the ambulance, and um, took him on to Adams County as well. Okay. And why did you choose Adams County? Uh, they wanted him to go there because that's where the other child had been taken. Um, that way they could keep every, everyone together and um, so that hopefully it wouldn't be as confusing. Okay. And do you recall approximately what time you got dispatched to um, take care of Ruger, Roden? Um, a little after 11. Okay. Um, and the same question to you, if I showed you your run report, would that refresh your recollection yes. as to an exact time? Okay. Actually, 
this is, these are, there are two pages that are stapled together. Um, if you can look at the, um, <coughs> the top page and tell me if you recognize that. Um, States Exhibit R2. Mm -hmm. uh, we were dispatched at 11.08. Okay, 11.08 a.m.? Yes. Okay. And, and then does it indicate, um, uh, well, approximately? Actually, that was when we contacted. It didn't say when we were dispatched. Okay. That's when you were contacted? Yes. We okay. were, it had contact with Ruger. Oh, that you had contact with yes. Ruger? Okay. And it, does it indicate then when you um, left that residence and went to the hospital? Yes, 1113. Okay, so five minutes later, basically. Yes. Okay. And do you recall the condition that you found Ruger in? Um, he was, he, he had blood um, on his head, on his arms and legs, and various parts of his body. Um, he didn't appear to have any visible injuries. Um, he was looking around and, and um, age appropriate. Okay. And, and obviously this was some time after you had first arrived, because I believe you said it was like 8.13, or yes. I don't remember the exact time. No. Yes. Um, but, so it had been a few hours. Yes. Since, um, okay. And um, when you came upon him, did you have any knowledge as to whether or not anybody had tried to remove any of the blood or anything to your knowledge? I don't know. Okay. When you found him, did he in fact have some blood on him? Yes, he did. Okay. Just yeah, cue one. Um, I'm going to um, show you now what's been marked as States Exhibit Q1. It will show on your screen there. Mm -hmm. And just ask you if you, and please don't, please. Do you recognize that child there? Yes. And, and who do you recognize him as? Ruger. Okay. And that is the child or the infant that you took care of that morning on April 22nd of 2016? Yes. Okay. And um, Q2, please. Showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Q2. Again, there appears to be blood on his legs and feet and head and face. Um, is that consistent with the condition you found him in? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us when you were examining him, um, did you personally take care not to clean him up or anything yes. at that time? Okay. And Q3. Again, is that consistent with the condition you found him in? Yes. And then Q4. Again, do you recall seeing him in that condition? Yes. Okay. And um, can you tell us what the... Um, can you tell us what the concern was or were you aware of what any concern was as to why um, they wanted him transported to? I was told this. Um, the social service workers were concerned that he was found laying between his parents. Um, and with there being a shooting, um, there was concern for hearing or maybe a rupture of an eardrum um, due to a possible uh, loud noise. Three. And just showing you um, what's been marked as Q3, and I apologize, that if you see on inside his ear, there appears to be a lot of blood. Yes. Okay. Um, and so obviously they would not know what the origination of that blood yes. was. Is that correct? Okay. Um, that's good. Thank you. And then the second page of that um, exhibit, R2, um, can you tell me what that is? 
Um, that is where we get our signatures. Um, we would have the hospital sign that we arrived and that they were taking care of the patient. Um, we would have someone sign in this case where it was a minor saying that we have permission to transport. Uh, but okay. yeah, that's our signature page. Okay. And then you keep a copy of that for your records? Yes. Okay. And again, is that something you do in your normal course of business? Yes. Okay. And I don't know that I asked you, but is R2, is that something again that you filled out in your handwriting? Yes. And placed your signature on that? Yes. As your run report? Okay. And what did you do after you had delivered Ruger Road into the Adams County Hospital? Um, after we left the hospital, we returned to service. Okay. And do you know what time it was that you arrived, that you would have arrived at the hospital with Ruger? Uh, 11.43. And then you said you returned to your station? Yes. Okay. And so did you go back into ser service or regular service at that time? Yes, we did. All right. So while you were out there at, at those locations on Union Hill Road, did you ever enter any of the residents at any time? No, I did not. Okay. I have no other questions, Your Honor. All right. The defense may cross examine. We have no questions. You may step down. All right, very compelling testimony there. Um, difficult um, even to watch, and that's understandable. We're dealing with a really horrific case here. Um, I want to bring in our guest for this hour, um, Jack Rice, former prosecutor, criminal defense attorney, Josh Schiffer, criminal defense attorney. Um, gentlemen, there's always two victims when we're talking about a murder. There are the victims that pass, and then there are the victims that live. And I think that we have our answer as to why we were hearing the testimony from this particular paramedic, uh, Jack Rice. When we watch her, what you realize is, is imagine what it is to be a healthcare worker. Somebody is a paramedic who's there to, to protect, to take care of somebody, and you see a baby, you see a child, and you're going to take them to the hospital, and you start talking about the blood on their feet, the blood on their arms, the blood on their face, the blood on their head. And, and the next question is, well, what did you do? Well, I didn't touch the blood. Why? Because this is a crime scene. And yet... I thought that was really interesting. Oh, no, it was brilliant. Because I think what it does is it highlights, understand the trauma that somebody like this has to deal with on a daily basis. There's something called primary trauma and secondary trauma. In many ways, this is primary because you're in the midst of it and you see it and you feel it. And imagine being that person and saying, I can't wipe off the blood off the face of a baby because this is a crime scene. That is trauma. But it was also really important that she testify because now we know what happened to the baby and in and, 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 and that stage of this horrific crime. Right, Josh? Yeah, and, and it didn't come, it came appropriately, it came respectfully. It didn't come as a fire hose of information with one witness who's just gonna die. It was really a class act in how to present something that is deeply emotional, deeply important. And I want to follow up, the defense did the right thing. As we were just talking about, the defense stood up and nope, no questions, thank you very much. Uh, putting an acknowledgement on it, but also moving the ball forward because the defense wants to get away from this type of testimony and change the jury's attention to something that's more beneficial. The longer the jury ruminates on this kind of powerful, emotional, illustrative testimony, the more likely it is that it's gonna sink in that they have to do something about it. 